Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us on the sixth Architalk today. Um, just before um, the talk, um, I guess I would like to um, mention that we might have a few out of the round archi talks um, in near future. So um, usually we have like uh, the talks every fortnight, um, but as you might have seen the schedule or the posters, um, I will also clean up the uh, future posters soon. So you can just pin that up um, on your calendar. So um, a few of our talks are actually every week because we had uh, some international uh, our key tuckers, so uh, we wanted to accommodate them as well. So just stay tuned for those ones. Um, as you know, uh, we've invited Nick Bronston today. Um, Nick has recently begun with the State Government Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage as the Director of Design WA. Design WA is uh, a state government initiative to ensure good design is at the center of all developments in Western Australia. In this role, he is overseeing the full policy suit, which includes apartments, precincts, activity centers, neighborhoods, and medium density housing. Nick is also the director of architectural practice, Nick um, Bronston, formerly known as Post Architecture, and the director of the urban program Space Market, which pairs disused spaces with useful people. Um, since its formation, <clears throat> Space Market has paired over 400 tenants across 20,000 square meters of floor space and continues to work across Australia to activate forgotten, unloved and in-between uh, use spaces that test the changing nature of work and occupancy. His architecture practice is much awarded and operates locally and internationally from Perth Western Australia. Um, he has won many awards, just uh, in, uh, naming a few of them. In 2015, he, has, he was the winner of the Australian Institute of Architect Emerging um, Architect Award, firstly for Western Australia and then nationally. Uh, then um, he is a past nominee for the 40 Under 40 Young Business Leaders Award, a nominated thought leader for the city of Perth, the 2015 recipient of Dulux International Study um, Tour for Emerging Architects. And um, um, well, um, I guess um, I just leave the rest. <laughs> so many awards. Please check his website. Have you reflected those? Hopefully. Uh, yeah. If not, please do that. <laughs> um, and we are really pleased um, to have him here. So I would like to invite him for the talk. Nick, thank you. Thanks for that. Um, do I have to press something to record, or is it happening? Oh, it's recording. Yes. Cool. Um, thank you for having me. This is really lovely and an honor. I don't know. You probably aren't aware. I used to teach here. I, taught, I, I was a student here. I taught here from 2010 to 2014. Um, it's really nice to come back and see everyone again um, and see the building. It's like kind of by this stage, this building's just in your bones. Like you walk in here and you kind of feel scared and at home at the same time, which is you know, I don't know, kind of pretty off putting, but nice. Um, so I guess what I thought I'd do is, and I've kind of misread the room a bit because what I've I want to talk about, um, I actually I tried to project backwards and go, what was I feeling at your stage sitting in this room? When I say you, I mean students, so staff, sorry, you just <laughs> fall asleep or do whatever you like. Um, <clears throat> and try and kind of think back to like, what did it feel like, you know, in your last or in your university life and in these years and as you're pressing forward and your mum and your dad ask you every day, you know, what jobs are there at the end of this course? and what are you going to do with your degree and, you know, how are you going to make money or, you know, how are you going to make me proud and all that sort of stuff. So I thought I'd like kind of a bit narcissistically but in a, I guess, more of a, hopefully, a way that helps you give you some bit of comfort, show you like just what I've done because um, I've kind of covered a pretty broad range of things about what architects are and what architects can be and what you can do in this world and there's not one kind of architect and there's not one kind of outcome and 
the best thing that I think architecture gives you is this amazing foundational um, understanding of the world and systems and bits and pieces and how to pull stuff together. And as the world becomes smaller and people do things for cheaper um, and you can always be undercut in price, the thing that is the biggest value that you have is your ability to think and the ability to think strategically. And I think architecture gives you the greatest um, base for that. So that's kind of the framework of this. There's not going to be too many pretty pictures. It's going to be more of a story. If you want pretty pictures, go to my Instagram, go to the website, whatever. Um, it's all there. Okay, I thought I'd also then start by couching it in this, which I love. It's kind of like the architecture building again. It's like the scariest but most liberating thing that you can think of, which is the cosmic calendar, which what it does is it basically breaks down a year, the, the history of the universe to what a year. So what would we think of, you know, what happens in a year? And this is kind of, kind of to try and take the pressure off, you know, you all get, I don't know, who's everyone here? I don't know, first years and second years don't normally turn up to this sort of stuff, they don't care. Oh, well done. Nice. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but everyone else, you know, you're kind of starting to think, oh, God, I'm about to graduate, or, you know, in a year or two, I've got to go get work experience, I've got to build up my CV, I've got to do all this sort of stuff. Anyway, um, I just kind of like to think about space and the universe a lot, and just how small and insignificant and fragile and unimportant it all is, which therefore, as the counterpoint, makes everything and your life and what you're doing so important. So that's just what happens in the space of the year, or you know, if, the, if the history of the universe was condensed to a year. What it basically says is that all of human history happens in the last 60 seconds of the year. So you go through the whole year and then you hit December 31, 11.59, and that is when humans start sort of arriving and writing things down. And basically, you know, then you get down to 10, 20, sorry, 15, 10, 5, basically just like that. So that's the, that's the context, the broad context that we are all living and operating in, which I think is a very nice way to kind of think about things. So in terms of me, this is the start. Um, I, as I said, I was a student here. I wasn't a great student. Um, I was a bit of a rat bag. I kind of, after third year, I went and lived in Melbourne and worked for a year. I took a year off. I left this building and thought I'd never come back. I'd sort of had it. Um, I worked for an architect over there, came back, thought I knew everything and was, yeah, pretty not good to be. Well, I, I kind of, I look back now and see your architecture course as the greatest opportunity you have to like really kind of be very self-indulgent. Like once you kind of get out into the world, you have all these pressures of time and money and all that sort of stuff. And here you're literally given a brief and being told to just go think about that for you know, three months. And you don't get that opportunity elsewhere. And that that is now something on reflection, I kind of look back on and go, yeah, probably missed that. Um, anyway, so I lived in Melbourne. Um, I went back there as soon as I finished. I started my practice up here, which was above a pub on Brunswick Street in Fitzroy, which is the most dangerous, terrible place to start a practice, get nothing done. Um, doing little speculative bits of work, um, sort of renos for friends. And during that time, I then got approached um, by a builder to go over to Dubai. That's um, a camera stuck on the top of the spire of the Burj Khalifa, looking straight back down. Um, and I kind of thought this is basically like, this is my first little sideways detour. I'd start, I'd finished uni, I'd run, I was running a small little practice and then this kind of came out left field. And at that point I was kind of like, just say yes to everything. So I went to Dubai or Abu Dhabi, which is now south of that. So this is what Dubai looked like in 1990. That's it, 18 years later. Um, and then obviously we've got another 10 years on top of that. So you're in this kind of context that's just completely out of this world and crazy. I like that photo. Um, I was working on terrible stuff, like just shocking. <laughs> but it was huge, like so I went over there and I went from me in my little practice above the pub um, with no staff, working on tiny renos and things like that, to over here working on like 100 villa developments in charge of a staff of like 50 people and a building staff of 3,000 and, you know, I was 26, 27 at the time and kind of that was, it was one of those things where it was a great experience um, but at some point I just couldn't reconcile the context and the work and what I was doing in that you had this kind of, I don't know, horrible juxtaposition of kind of white capitalist wealth against um, 
basically slave labour. And, you know, we'd be sitting on buses on weekends and driving around and clinking glasses and kind of cheersing uh, success, driving down freeways, you know, at 50 degrees outside with people digging holes in, you know, ditches. And um, I just kind of couldn't stop not looking at that anymore. And so I had to give it up. And I read this, which is kind of, I don't know, it's a bit problematic this, these days, but it's um, The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. And it had a forward in it that talked about that the book isn't for everyone. It's for, you know, people who hold a fire and hold something that they feel like they need to get done. And I was reading this on the plane, heading back to Melbourne on what I thought was going to be a little, like, um, one week break to then head back again and I was just bawling my eyes out and realised that I needed to change something. And I did. So I quit my job, broke up with my girlfriend, sold my car, um, had to spend all my money to get everything back and went back to Melbourne and I was living on my grandma's floor uh, with no job, no car, no money, no girlfriend and I was happier than I'd ever been. <laughs> so I kind of call that day zero. It's like the reset, starting again. Um, I then started working with a dear friend, a lady, Wendy Nettle, who do, did lovely work um, in suburban and uh, rural Victoria. Stuff like this, which kind of was just almost like getting back into the craft of architecture again. You know, like starting to relearn all the stuff, but now, you know, after having gone through that sort of detour, you know, reappreciating it. Um, then what happened was uh, I fell in love with another girl and she moved to Perth and so I had to follow her back. And that was about then. Um, <clears throat> the girl's now my wife. And we have one kid and another kid due in three weeks. Uh, anyway, so, <laughs> which may be the reason I might, that it's going to be right on the edge of missing that class, but we'll see. <laughs> um, but so then, when I moved back to Perth, it was really... I never thought I'd live in Perth again. When I left Perth, I thought that was it, I was done. And then my girlfriend moving over here and me kind of not wanting to commit to it, but sort of hopping back and forth for a, almost a year and then actually going, no, like, you know, I've got to... You've got to set down roots somewhere. And coming back to Perth, I think I was 29, I was like, that's, that's it, this is it. It's time to kind of, you know, if you're in a place, you need to commit to that place and it's incumbent on you to try and make that place better. And so this phase, I really kind of talked about, this is sort of the building phase, this is where I went, all right, you know, like I've done all that stuff, I've kind of flitted around a bit, I've done the detour, it's now time to start getting stuff together. So the first thing I did was I took an office, so this is um, on King Street in the city above Uncle Joe's. I, basically, I came back to Perth with, I reckon, I had a budget of about 500 bucks a week to spend on my office and my house. And I ended up putting it all into my office and living in a garage in a friend's place. Because um, I thought, you know, fake it to make it, got to like make a statement, got to like, I'm here, I want to do work, I'm in the city. Um, that's kind of what that was about. I was here for nine years, I only moved out a month or two ago, it's kind of sad. Um, what was really interesting was that I then put, you guys still do document, right? Do you still do document? Or is it gone? Occasionally we do. Okay. Occasionally. It's no longer a yearly publication, but we're trying to re-establish it. Okay. What I did is I pulled out my old document and I found that the first, pro first design project I ever did in first year, which is that one on the top there, um, was a gallery studio on King Street in Perth. And I was like, Jesus Christ, you know that? Like, I only found that, I kind of like put that together later and I was like, there's a bit of karma in that somehow. Um, obviously starting up practice on your own, kind of like, it's hard. You need to, being a good designer isn't enough you need to have all these other skills and it's the stuff that there's this great books, great courses, um, you know, they call it like the e-myth, which is the entrepreneurial myth or the e-snap, which is, you know, you're good at something, so you go, okay, well, I'm going to keep doing this thing, but being good at a thing doesn't actually mean that you're good at business, so you've got to kind of like learn to do that sort of stuff. And I didn't find any kind of like any derogatory in the idea or the term of being, being a hustler, um, because I'd also seen a lot of friends and other contemporaries and people around town who I thought fell in the other two categories, which if that kind of makes sense as a diagram, you know, the charlatan, the person who kind of talks a big game but can't deliver, or the martyr, someone who works their ass off but doesn't actually kind of get out there and 
promote themselves or like, no, it's promote like, you know, it's, marketing isn't a dirty word, but it's like, you know, trying to kind of like actually connect with people and do good work with good people. So that's what I was trying to do. Um, we did a lot of sort of comp competition speculations, like that was a commendation in New York. This one got nothing, but I really liked it. Um, we came second in this, which was the Marta Milley, um Artist Facility up in Newman, that um, you know, Officer Woods won that one. That would have been really good. The, the proposal for that was we were using all the overburden, which is the, the, basically the rock that isn't all mineral up at the mines there, and basically turning that into the walls and the shape of the building. Um, I was teaching at UWA in Curtin. That was really fun. Uh, at the same time, because we had the first floor in King Street, the City of Perth was released this, which is the Forgotten Places Act Upper Floor Activation Report, which kind of talked about how to sort of, you know, like reactivate spaces. And I'd kind of like just gone through that. And we went to them with some kind of like, the report was great, but it wasn't. It like talked about a lot of stuff, but didn't have any actions at the end of it. And so then we kind of went, well, you know, this is a big thing. There was 40,000 square metres of, floor, of empty floor space across Perth. Perth was, you know, in the middle of the boom still. People were coming. We needed to, like, we're bursting at the seams. So it was like, how do we actually do this? And this is us brainstorming it. And we came up with the idea of Space Market, which was, you know, a platform that identified um, underutilised urban areas and sort of almost crowdsourced or, you know, paired useful businesses with those spaces. So we kind of did a bit of an audit across Perth and set up this website and set up a staff and, you know, had, had it running, which was really good. That was about that stage. Um, that then led to, I guess, this period of speculation, which is kind of saying, well, you know, like, we're in the city, you're doing some work, here's some ideas, you've kind of got to commit. And so at that point, we went, all right, well, you have to demonstrate to show what you're talking about. So we came across this project called Moana, which is a first floor on Hay Street Mall. Um, it was a building that was, was described as the finest in the Commonwealth at the time, built in 1897. It had been vacant for 25 years when we found it. Um, what we did is we kind of wanted to show people that you know, first floors or you know, underutilised spaces can be used and it's not expensive. There was a quote on this space from the building owners that said it was going to cost them $1.5 million to do it up. We did it for $150,000. Um, and that was just really about kind of like going slowly and methodically through things, working around the codes, working out what actually people required and sort of trying to creatively, I guess, problem solve that. Um, it became a, a cafe, gallery and co-working space. So we basically tried to be really, really sensitive, like all the other proposed, the building works proposals were all to like drop ceilings and cover the walls and build rabbit warrens and we just wanted to kind of like create distinct programs but also understand the places where they inter interlocked and came together. So like the gallery became a nice place for people, you know, that became a magnet to bring people up off the street which would, you know, also interface with the cafe um, and the cafe would be an informal meeting space for the co-working space um, and you'd have these kind of different time sets of, you know, like the cafe, you know, the gallery was a nighttime thing, the cafe was a day thing, the co-working space kind of hum hummed along the rest of the time. Um, we also gave the ga gallery a mandate just to freak Perth the fuck out. So they like just do really kind of quite wild things. Don't be restrained. Could we basically we, we set the financial model up so the cafe the gallery didn't have to make any money. So they could just kind of present art that wasn't, you know, had any commercial um, output, which is, you know, kind of an interesting thing. Yeah, anyway, so that's the space. Um, there's the co-working space at the back. So the gallery kind of also acted as this like big buffer. So, you know, it kind of separated the two things, created a bit of a sound barrier. Um, and it was this sort of looming presence in the space. That ran for five years. We had to shut it down because the owners, after we did all the work for them, decided that they wanted to jack the rent up on us. Um, and we just couldn't justify it. So, you know, it did a five-year project. It was a five-year project. It showed people what could be done on first floors. It showed people that there were these creative communities that wanted to come together and that Perth had a great art scene and a great cafe on the, on the deck. Um, that then led to basically going from kind of mild speculating to what I'm kind of calling the all-in period, which from that we got approached by the city of Fremantle that they told us that Meyer, if anyone knows the old Meyer building in King Square, that Meyer had just decided to leave. This is about 2012 and Meyer was like the biggest tenant in Fremantle. Everyone thought that if Meyer left then Fremantle was dead. Um, and they asked us if we wanted to come in and basically reproduce what we did at Moana in Meyer. The difference being that Moana was 350 square metres and Maya was 20,000. You should all be like terrified and like still get a lump in my heart from that. 
Um, so we said yes, because all in. Um, kicked the whole thing off with a banging party on the roof. I think it was totally illegal. Um, and then kind of very sensitively, actually ran it as a studio here as well. We, um, we did a basically, so the, the building was, is five floors. We put it, had a gallery, a retail floor, a maker floor, an artist studio floor, and a party floor. And we um, did this kind of co-creation process of working out how do you design without physical bits. And we created this really, really great document which talked about how the retail floor would self-organise. Um, and it became almost like a game of fences where there was this really, I think I've got a pick. That's it opening. So the, the floor like just had this kind of, you know, real rational structural grid, like almost maze on domino. And that became the, the framework of how we'd relocate retail inside those bits and then there were rules about proximity and you know how close you could be in sight lines and preserving an open floor plate and all that sort of stuff and it was a really interesting way of kind of designing without a built well there was a built outcome but kind of like being more of just like clicked that's almost like my first policy play um to kind of like writing policy or saying like this is how we want an outcome without you know being too dictatorial so it opened it really made a big splash everyone loved it um it kind of was showcasing the best of WA, entrepreneurial retail, people doing interesting things. Um, our big move was to put a big red curtain in the middle that kind of organised and created sort of levity in the space and everything spun around that. Um, our maker spaces, we've like, we've grown, so we've graduated over 30 businesses, so this is people that didn't think that they wanted to run a small business, came in here, started a business, were successful and then have gone outside of it and created and taken on leases and grown businesses into, you know, fully fledged ongoing enterprises. So that's like a real source of, source of pride. We kept saying that this thing is really like an incubator. We didn't want it to be a carnivorous sort of, um, you know, hyper gentrification thing of being, let's bring in a bunch of cool people. And then when the developers are ready to develop the building, kick them all out and, you know, thanks for doing that for us and making us look cool for that period. We really actually wanted to have a legacy. That's the gallery in the basement. Um, <clears throat> we initially started by calling it Maya, like as in muck and Maya, a bit of like a kind of a sticky boggy thing um, until we got sued. <laughs> so Maya then wrote us a letter that's saying you can't really do that. Um, we thought we kind of had a case, but then I got advice which was in the law, in law it's not who's right, it's who's got the most money. And I knew that absolutely wasn't us in this case, so um, we kind of stepped back and we got it many. Still kept the M, still kept the four letters, moved away. Then what also happened in the first um, month is we got our first energy bill, which I don't know if you can see that. We were told it was going to be five thousand dollars a month, and so to get the first one at fifty was basically well, killed the project. Well, but you know the doors were still open and we were still racking this up. So then we just kind of went into absolute panic mode. Um, we ended up solving it. And what had happened is when the people de decommissioned the building, they forgot to turn off some air, um, some compressors on the roof that were running air conditioning systems, and they were just running just all the time, which was you know it was still a hundred thousand um, dollar issue we had to deal with. Uh, we hired a project manager who was embezzling money off us, so that's great, had to fire him. Um, my business partner at the time also uh, left, um, there's more to that story. Uh, we're, this is uh, personally related, this is someone I would, this is so we ran a bit, we ran, started Space Market together, um, ran our practice together and we were in a relationship together and all that ended. Uh, yeah, that's that. Um, so that's when that happened. So that was a real kind of like, you know, going all in and really making some big mistakes and circumstantially being smashed with a lot of stuff as well. And so I kind of had this like, you know, it was, I went and saw psychiatrists a lot, um, which is, no, which is like a mental health specialist. I highly recommend it. Um, and yeah, just kind of tried to unload and just work out what the hell was going on. So the first thing I did was I wrote a constitution for space market, which is like how we're going to ethically act and be in the world and just kind of like tried to reset there. And then I also joined a business class. Um, so this is the Curtin Centre for Entrepreneurship. Because um, I figured that if you're doing these sorts of things, um, you, as I kind of said before, you need to learn the language and you need to learn the toolkit of business um, and I was kind of saying it was like being it was like being 
transported to Russia and then being frustrated you couldn't speak Russian, like, so just go and learn Russian. So that's what I did. This was a year and a half course and it was really, really great. I um, also did a lot of community work through Space Market. We launched some apps. Um, we did a lot of engagement with some federal parties and tried to sort of do some good policy shaping work. I was teaching here at Curtin there, two of my master's students. Um, that was a lot of fun. Um, Re-engaged with practice, got that kind of, you know, I guess, back and going again. And then just started slowly, slowly sort of, you know, building up um, a body of work here in Perth. Just all this stuff. Then I won the Emerging Architect Award, which only happened because of these people. Um, so after that, then I kind of call after that, that reloading phase, I'm just sort of saying this is sort of the steady state, which is, you know, kind of had some good projects to show, um, had some recognition, had been in Perth long enough, had kind of, you know, built a reputation and just sort of ticked along. So we did some nice work on Elizabeth Key, um, which a lot of it didn't get done. So we built, we did this proposal for some little trading pods that would go around, sort of itinerant traders, might be florist, ice cream, whatever. Um, we kind of open and close at night. We did a proposal for river baths before all the ones you're seeing now. Everyone's forgotten that we did that. Uh, these water temples that we put around as well because we thought the idea of Elizabeth Key was the river and the sea together again and that there's this history of promenading on the site and the history and the idea of water, so we're trying to bring those things together. Um, and then Jewel Lake Study Tour, like I can only recommend that highly enough. If you ever get the chance, go for it. They kind of, it's not all about, you know, um, presence and recognition. They like award people based on career tra trajectory. Um, but even if you don't, just, you know, like study tours and travel is the best thing. Study tours was a lot of standing around in groups with umbrellas and you know, photos. That one on the right, on your right is a, um, that was in, we were in this building in Tokyo and that's the client there, Klein Dykeman. They, they're actually, as well as architects, they're the people that started up Petra Kutcher. So they released that to the world. And anyway, she's sitting there and we're asking her about the earthquake credentials of this building and at the moment that John said earthquake, the building started shaking mm -hmm. and she was like, okay, everyone up, come with me. And we like ran and we stood next to the column. She's like, you know, in an earthquake, that's the best place to stand. And we're like, well, gosh, you're in an earthquake. You're like, who better to be standing with than the architect of the building? <laughs> um, it's Tezuka Architects on the one side uh, and, um, oh God, I've forgotten the guy's name on the other side. Anyway. Really great opportunity to like to meet some great architects and actually see practice and see, you know, the guys who are the real exemplars in their field doing their work. Uh, another project that was kind of sticking along in this period is our North Perth House. This is coming up on Grand Designs. We got selected for that, which is really lovely. Um, it'll be end of this year, start of next year. Uh, it's pretty radical in that it's so that's the diagram. Um, the client wanted a concrete house, but they couldn't afford a concrete house. So I said, let's do concrete, but do it as a commercial system. So um, uh, precast, or you know, like kind of like tilt slab. So we made all of these concrete ribs in a factory. They're all there's only two types. There's a the ground floor type and a first floor type. And then how do you actually make a house work inside those things? So it was kind of like a game of you know, moving things around and getting it all together. So. Um, that's how we made the budget work. That's how we gave them a concrete house. The whole thing went together in two days on site, as in the, the concrete structure, which then meant the trades could come in and just build, um, get some nice little moments in it. That's it on day two. It looks a lot different to that now. It's almost finished. Um, another study tour to Portugal, uh, meeting some of my heroes and seeing some of their projects. Uh, this is Aries Mateus, if anyone knows him. He's an amazing Portuguese architect. Machada. Um, uh, uh, Sutra de Mora, uh, Mateus again, and the great thing is, so this is, so I got to like, I got to go to this is this is him, this is Mateus, I got to go with him, and um, he didn't know who I was or didn't like, because I somehow tacked along to a tour that they were already doing, and then um, he invited me, and like we sat in his car and drove around town, and he was telling me all these things, and then like you know, as he was leaving, he said so I, I was there with my wife and my daughter. And then he was like, oh, where's Bo? And I was like, oh, she's in the other room. I have to say goodbye to Bo. And like ran in and like, you know, said goodbye and gave her a tickle. And it's like, you know, when your heroes actually kind of, heroes can normally only disappoint you. So like when they actually kind of meet, you know, rise to that standard, it was like, yeah, very heartwarming. 
and we also got to meet Alvaro Caesar. Does anyone know Caesar? So he's he's almost 90 now. Um, he might even be 90. And we went into his office on a public holiday and he was in his room working on a public holiday, which is either like, I kind of find quite sad, but you know, he was there, so that was good. Um, and we were walking around and I was with someone who was showing us around and sees looked out and and the guy with kind of go, goes in and goes to see him, oh, I'm here with someone, do you know, can we come in? And he looks over and he sees my daughter, Bo, and goes, Ah, oh, a baby, come in. Yes. <laughs> so, like, if you're ever going to travel, bring a baby. They open all the doors. Um, we then did a, a, we're doing a lot of work internationally at the moment. So this is a proposal for an onsen and spa building in China. It's kind of, it's got a little resort aspect to it as well. Um, this is a, a nature retreat in, Ar, uh, in Aruba, in Lisbon, Portugal. It's a little wellness, 16-bed um, kind of global leadership centre. This is our Bali project that just completed um, on the north coast of Tejikula. Again, sort of kind of calling it this idea of rugged regionalism. The idea being that, uh, you know, we, so this is a design competition, we won it. Um, northern coast of Bali, you know, like kind of pretty remote in terms of um, skills and materials and resources. So we, I just kind of, well, sorry, we went, you know, well, what, do, what does Bali do well? do bamboo and concrete, so let's use bamboo and concrete. So we basically, all the, the, the project is seven basically walls, parallel walls, that situate you in the truth of the site, which is you're right on the ocean, you've got this amazing mountain behind you. So everywhere in every room, <coughs> you're, or you've you always got a view of one of the two things, well, of two, but actually both things at the same time. We've designed it so that when you're lying in bed, you can turn your head one way and see the ocean, turn your head the other way and see the mountain. And then just kind of, you know, Bali's hot, humid, nothing, you know, ever stays clean, so work with that. So, you know, choose a way of building, constructing that will age and, you know, build patina over time and look better and, you know, not try and force skills upon people that don't have it and, you know, like kind of uh, celebrate the roughness. So it did things like kind of, you know, you get these lovely little tight funneled views as you head back towards the mountain and then these expansive views as you head back to the ocean. Um, that's... We also did a sheer cut on each end, so it's kind of you had a human scale of bamboo on the inside, smaller bamboo, and then larger on the outside. But then at the two ends, it turned into sheer walls because if anyone knows, like the traditional Balinese gateways, they kind of have these really ornamental three sides, and then the side you pass through is this really kind of like beautiful, clean, sheer face. So it's kind of trying to reference that kind of that gateways and these view corridors with these kind of gateways to these significant elements. Um, but yeah, I work for government now, which is kind of interesting. I still have practice and um, but it was kind of interesting how this came along. So I, while we were doing that work we partnered with a builder called Collier Homes who are like a mass scale builder, like a project home builder. Um, I'd always had this feeling that Perth was doing density very badly and that we needed to um, try and fix that um, in terms of medium density housing. So I thought, and, and then that how do we actually kind of like, you know, as an architect you're working project by project and it's really hard to kind of like have impact as in you do like one house, like that house in North Perth that's on Grand Designs, it's great, but it's like it's one house for four people, like so what? Um, so the idea was to try and build, do something that, you know, had, because also a lot of people can't afford an architect, a lot of people can't afford good design. So how do you actually make good design something that's actually embedded in the process or embedded in building to begin with? So we designed a, a bunch of um, pre-designed well, pre -pre houses that were all costed and um, spec'd and, you know, basically that the, the innovation cost was up front and then it was distributed across, I guess, the network as it got rolled out. So we'd sort of designed these little small footprint houses that would go in people's backyards. So, sorry, the NIMBY was obviously, does everyone know what a NIMBY is? Okay, so you know what a NIMBY is then? So NIMBY is, NIMBYism, or NIMBY stands for not in my backyard. So we call these things NIMBY because it was, they're, they're going to be in my backyard. Um, and they kind of look like this, so it was a sort of one story, two, sorry, one story studio option, a two story option that had three bedrooms, um, kind of all natural materials, all kind of pretty panelled and modular, but sort of just constructed and put together as kind of nicely. Um, and then, yeah, what was this about? Oh, this was just about saying, well, this is 
purse growth pattern. So if you look at, um, so this is what we were targeting, kind of that we've got this problem in Perth where like the lure of the beach, the lure of the ocean, that we expand north south and we're kind of capped out at the hills. Um, but we've gone from, you know, 1925, what does it say there, 25 kilometres of, you know, approximate coastal occupation to, uh, what's that one, 1974, 60 kilometres to 2012 is the last one, where we're now sort of 150 kilometres long on our coast and we just can't keep doing this. We can't expand forever and ever and ever because um, general amenity, quality of life, I don't know if anyone's families, you know, like my family, my, my brother's just moved 45 minutes across the other side of the city and like I just don't ever see him anymore. Um, so like how do you, how do you give people a diversity of housing options and choice to live in the suburbs and communities that they want to where suburbs aren't defined by a singular housing type or singular price point? So there was this idea in this um, Directions 2050 or Perth and Pilot 3.5 million report that talked about, you know, how do we actually think about Perth's future urban form? You know, if we kept it, if we kept all our development as 100% infill, then that kind of means we've got to cap that at our growth boundaries. If we do the opposite of that where we say let's provide this next, you know, for this next 30 years, let's provide 70% greenfield and 30% infill, that means we just start expanding even more and more, you know, out to the the south and east and north east and you know it means we're actually eating into you know um, remnant bushland and uh, you know and the actual cost of creating new communities um, per single dwelling is many 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 times greater than actually providing more housing in existing locations and then there's the other model here which is if you did 40 47 percent infill and 53 percent greenfield which is kind of a bit of a compromise solution which i still reckon is too high um, that's maybe what our cities would look like. So uh, through doing that work with IMBI, someone then offered, said, you know, that the state government's actually looking to tackle exactly this and sent me the application. So I'm an architect. This is the Department of Planning. The Department of Planning, I don't think, has any architects or anybody in it. I applied for the, the job because I thought the choice is either stick with IMBI and do best case 30 houses a year, um, worst case zero. Or do I get on the policy side of things and do 600,000 houses over the next 30 years? So for me, it was kind of a bit of a no-brainer. Um, but I still need to be go through the process and actually be selected. Um, and I thought that I'm either going to like fall the first hurdle or go through. And you know, I got through, and it's wonderful because it means the government's actually looking for. I think for the profession of architecture, it's wonderful to see that like architects are recognised as people that can lead policies like this, like this is the Department of Planning, I'm surrounded by planners, I'm surrounded by urban designers, I'm surrounded by I say, traffic engineers, you know, all these kind of people. But this, this is this policy that I'm in charge of now called Design WA <clears throat> is a policy to put design at the heart of all our built work in Perth from here on. So not being about box checking, you know, how far are you off a boundary or have you, you know, done this setback or got, you know, this much site coverage. It's now about performance based reading, which means that if you do, the, the, the rules are that there kind of are no rules. The rules are that if you adhere to qualitative things like sustainability and solar gain and um, neighbourhood context and built form and sensitivity and community, then that's how we assess buildings now rather than numbers in a table, which is really kind of pretty progressive and amazing. So we're now doing that. Um, we've already got a couple of policies out. I've only been doing this for two months. This happened before I was there. Um, these ones, residential design codes for the apartments, which is what we're looking at in your class. Just, yep. Um, and the precinct guidelines, so I think I said before we're doing. So Design WA covers apartments. So every apartment building that gets built has to conform to these things. Every um, precinct that gets designed, so precincts like, you know, a town. Um, every activity centre is like a bit inside a town. Um, every neighbourhood, which means how do you create a a community from scratch um, and then all medium density housing. So this touches everything except single houses. So everything that happens in Perth from now on is this and so it's the WA state government. Sorry when I say Perth I mean WA so we're all of all of Western Australia which the WA state government controls 92 percent of all land or all housing in WA. So it's everything. 
<clears throat> and so the, our big focus now is this thing called medium density housing, or what people have said, the missing middle, which is sort of what I explained before. So as we start trying to fill in our suburbs and create density, you know, you have to start looking at these different type housing options, like how do you live close together but still retain the amenity or the ideas of what a single house might have? Or maybe people don't want to live in a single house, maybe people actually like being closer to people or, you know, in smaller communities and smaller groups. Um, that was going to be another space slide, but that doesn't really matter anymore. Um, okay, that's it. That's me. Thank you. <laughs>